afternoon. Um, we are starting our uh, seminar. So um, today is, um, uh, my name is Marina Karanikolos and I'm from the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And together with my colleague, Erica Richardson, we will moderate today's seminar on how can we use health system performance assessment to support pandemic preparedness. And this is the third in series of webinars on health systems performance assessment. If you have been following uh, the series, then you know that they're dedicated to various aspects of HSPA and using HSPA as a tool for moving forwards with the universal health coverage. Here we highlight a diverse range of approaches that countries can take to health system performance assessment globally and how this can contribute to health system strengthening and resilience. We also explore different approaches to performance assessment to support policymakers in determining which areas to prioritize and direct resources towards. The two previous webinars were on organizing public health services and evaluating participatory governance, both within the context of HSPA. And this time we will look at how can we use health system performance assessment to support pandemic preparedness. As COVID-19 demonstrated, pandemics pose serious threats to both health and health systems. Pandemic preparedness plans enable strategic response and can guide action. They can also help to build resilience into health system to withstand future pandemics. At the same time, health systems performance assessment frameworks can be applied to pandemic preparedness planning to identify those strategies that improve health system resilience. So today we will look at which pandemic preparedness strategies strengthen health system resilience, can health system strengthening and pandemic preparedness align, and how can we use HSPA to support pandemic preparedness. But before we begin with our keynote and the panel, I will invite my colleague Erica Richardson from the observatory to launch our traditional poll. Please, Erica. Thank you very much for coming. So um, yes, just a quick poll to see where we are uh, with you as an audience. And we'd like to ask you where might having better pandemic preparedness contribute to health system performance in your country? So is it around quality? Is it around access? Is it around efficiency, equity, improving health outcomes, uh, people-centeredness or responsiveness, financial protection, or all of the, the above, or indeed none of the above? So please do let us know uh, your thoughts on this. And I look forward to seeing your uh, responses. Thank you very much. Back to you, Marina. Thank you so much, Erica. And uh, we will announce the results later. But now we have our keynote speaker, Caitlin Radford, and she's currently working as a health policy consultant. And previously, she did her master's at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she looked at how global health security and universal health care priorities could be better aligned to strengthen health system resilience to future pandemic. Please, Kaylin, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marina, for your kind introduction. And yes, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you here today to discuss some research I conducted last year into pandemic preparedness planning um, using the observatory's um, recently published health system performance assessment framework for universal health coverage. Um, that has been the focus of the three-part webinar series. Um, I'd like to say up front that this effort was supported by my kind supervisors, John and Marina, who is here with us today who helped me develop the concept of the project and provided their very um, helpful insight and guidance throughout. Next slide, please. Um, so as we everyone is well aware, pandemics have had a huge impact on health systems and water society. And the big question we sought to answer here is um, knowing this, why were health systems so poorly prepared? Um, the burden caused by the COVID-19 pandemic suggests a failure by many countries to adequately invest in measures to strengthen health system resilience as a means of pandemic preparedness planning. Um, next slide. The application of resilience to health systems is relatively new, but if we look here at the observatory's um, health system of performance assessment framework, um, which measures performance at a function level, the health system resilience means not only maintaining the performance of core um, health system functions, namely governance, resource generation, financing, and service delivery, but also um, the ability of a health system to continue um, to absorb, adapt, and transform and continue meeting the wider intermediate objectives of a health system, such as effectiveness, safety, user experience, access, as well as the final health system goals. So most here we have health improvement, which is the obvious one, but also people-centeredness and financial protection. 
um, in the context of the pandemic, we would expect a resilient health system to have strategies in, a, in place to help it cope with the consequences of a pandemic and help it and, and allow them to continue maintaining essential services um, and meeting these wider performance, health system performance goals. Indeed, the notion of preparedness of um, indeed the notion of health system resilience that we see that we see here encompasses this notion of preparedness and um, recognizes the need for it to be forward looking and, and to invest in such strategies as part of pandemic preparedness planning. Um, next slide. Um, pandemic plans are key documents at nationals and international levels that lay out a set of strategies um, required for to plan for and respond to large scale infectious disease outbreaks. Um, but they also have a much wider role in um, forming strategic, uh, much wider role in formulating policy action. And the WHO and the ECDC have, have advised and supported the development of such plans, as well as various self evaluation tools um, that can be used to evaluate. Um, the completeness of plans in respect to current global guidance and also assess their, the IHR report capacities of um, different countries in respect to their plans. Um, however, the current tools fail to systematically think about health systems and all its various and interlinking components, and there is a limited understanding as to how well the multidimensional effects pandemics have on health systems are truly being, um, are truly being thought about in these plans and considered in pen as means of pandemic preparedness. Um, this brings us, if you go to the next slide, to our um, to the research I conducted last summer across 14 pan, um, pandemic preparedness plans um, belonging to um, 13 countries in the EU and as well as the UK. Um, and I, uh, the aim of this research was to evaluate the extent to which strategies that would support a resilient health system response were actually being included in these plans. To do this, we use an adapted version of the health system performance framework, which if you go to the next slide, um, we linked um, we linked system-wide strategies that have been shown to prove um, to improve health system resilience in past pandemics to the framework assessment areas that we see here in yellow. These assessment areas serve to evaluate the performance of health system subfunctions and functions um, and their ability to continue meeting these wider um, health system objectives and final goals. The logic here is that such strategies are in effect a precondition of well working health system functions and they should be included in plans in order for um, countries to maximize their ability to respond resiliently in the face of a pandemic. Um, so after after adopting the health system performance framework, um, we if we could move on to the next slide, we assess the plans, um, we read through the plans um, systematically scoring the presence of a strategy on a three-point Likert scale, um, which you can see here. Um, notably, the, the scoring system was rather simplistic, and it must be stressed that this study only offers a preliminary means of assessing the existence of a strategy in a plan and is not indicative of a country's level of actual preparedness. Unweighted average scores were then calculated for each country by health system function and subfunction, and heat maps were developed um, to illustrate our findings. So if we go on to the next slide, I have just kind of our overarching um, result of heat map that was developed, um, which indicates the um, presence of strategies by health system function as well as a subfunction in the report um, that is to be published. There's we go into more detail and list the assessment areas, but for the for the sake of time in this presentation, just going to touch on the main overarching findings that we found. Um, evidently, it seems that. It seems that current plans do not adequately cover some health system functions, especially financing, with little to no um, strategies found across plans to support the collection of revenue, pooling of funds, purchasing of goods and services, um, and structures to support final um, public financial management. Um, most um, plans did cover, um, did touch on mechanisms to ensure effective governance, including um, strategies to um, support participatory leadership, collaboration between governments and key stakeholders, surveillance and um, information monitoring systems, um, and the legislative capacity of governments to enforce response measures. Likewise, um, in regards to resource generation, plans did do well to cover um, the uh, strategy to support the availability and distribution of pharmaceuticals and other consumables. Um, however, much less attention was given to um, strategies to support the availability distribution and maintenance of medical equipment and infrastructure. Similarly, strategies to support the availability, scale of capacity and well-being of um, the health workforce were um, generally sparse among, uh, across plans. And 
there was limited mention of um, of crisis training and cross skill training for staff that would support flexible implementation and distribution of staff during a crisis. Finally, looking at the um, service delivery um, functions here, the scores are all generally limited by a lack of consideration for capturing user experiences um, of services being delivered. The strategies to support the effectiveness and safety of service delivery, which were the other, some other assessment areas, were generally better mentioned, um, and they included triaging systems, remote um, e-health consultations, and facility rearrangements. However, these were generally focused on ways to maintain um, and manage the treatment of the pandemic disease, with much, le with much um, less attention given to ways of maintaining and integrating services being delivered to um, continue other essential care, such as vaccination programs, the management of non-communicable diseases, as well as preventative screening processes. Um, while most health systems in Europe eventually found ways to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was evident that with those with the more robust initial capacities found it easier to initiate and resiliently respond to the pandemic. Our findings eliminate Finland's plan as quite comprehensively covering system-wide strategies to strengthen health system resilience. Um, correspondingly, the impact of COVID-19 in Finland was not as extensive as seen in other countries in the EU. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so ana ana analyzing the pandemic plans according to this adapted um, health system performance framework proved to be a useful exercise in identifying capacity gaps in preparedness planning and demonstrating how the application of health system performance frameworks can be used um, to assess pandemic plans and help inform um, policy actions and revision of plans ahead of future pandemics. Most notably, the study stressed the need to address health system financing mechanisms in pandemic preparedness plans to ensure there is space for extra funding, appropriate instruments for reallocating money, and ways to ensure flexible yet transparent account, account and accountable purchasing of goods and services during a pandemic. Similarly, um, the lack of consideration for strategies to understand user experience um, reflects a focus of a likely focus of policymakers on more urgently seeming objectives. However, we've clearly seen during the pandemic the importance of community participation and trust in health systems in response interventions and collecting information on how best to deliver and tailor services to meet the needs of different populations is critical to enabling countries to respond to the pandemic in a manner that leaves no one behind. Um, seeing as the study only offers a preliminary means of, assess of, of using HSPA frameworks um, to identify capacity gaps in pandemic plans, a useful next step would be to evaluate the actual capabilities of health systems to respond resiliently to, pan to a pandemic using their prepared strategies, which would involve developing um, resilience indicators. Um, for instance, we see that despite most plans um, listing strategies to support governance functions, there was a failure of many governments to lead an effective response to COVID-19, suggesting that as this was discussed in previous um, webinars of this series, it is much harder to make the link between um, the performance of governance functions and um, the attainment of the wider health system objectives and final goals and more work is needed in this space. Encouraging um, the participation and stimulation exercises that assess health systems performance and capabilities um, would help support the development of um, recommendations on what contextually specific investments are needed in health system strengthening um, to best prepare health systems ahead of future pandemics. And with that, I hand it back over to you, Marina, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the great presentation. And I know it was a huge task to go through and assess all of these plans. And it's great to see that the framework has been of use for you to guide the analysis of the national pandemic preparedness plans. Before we move on to our spotlight speakers, let's have a look at the poll results. Erica, please. Well, one of the striking uh, um, aspects to come through from the poll is that all of the above was near, almost half of the respondents said all of the above were, uh, you know, uh, being uh, taken, uh, contributing. Um, and hearteningly, None of, none of the above was chosen by none of the respondents. So this is heartening, I think, um, and quite a good spread across the board with the other results. So thank you very much for your responses, everyone. Back to you, Marlene. Thank you, Erica. Yes, this is very interesting to see how it actually affects the whole of the health system. And now we're moving to our excellent spotlight speakers. So today we have Professor Michael Soto from Georgetown University, 
We also have Professor Lina Kaiser-Tinkinen from the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. And we have Dr. Paula Vasconcelos from the Director General of Health of Portugal. And we will start from Professor Michael Stoto. He is a Professor Emeritus in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the School of Health at Georgetown University. And Michael's research focuses, among other things, on public health practice with regard to emergency preparedness. And during the pandemic, Michael was working on how surveillance can guide decision making. He is also working with the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control and the University of Bologna on the assessment of public health emergency preparedness. Michael, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Marina, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all uh, for this presentation today. Um, I think that that Katie's presentation really set me up well for what I wanted to do because. Um, as countries around the world, people around the world have asked, were we prepared for COVID? And even in the, in the past have been asking, are we prepared for these, this and future um, uh, events? Um, we found that um, there has been a lot of work going on about measurement and assessment of preparedness, but it's been largely independent of the HSPA uh, approach that, that Katie was, was talking about. Um, part of it has to do with the HSPA focusing on healthcare, I would say, delivery systems, um, and a lot of the other work focusing on public health systems more broadly. Obviously, there's a lot of overlap, but the perspective you, you start in uh, matters a lot. Um, but on the other hand, there are some commonalities, and I think that some ideas about what I call measurement science um, have been um, prominent in both of these um, approaches. And I want to think about three different questions we have to ask and illustrate each of them. Why measure, what to measure, and how to measure. So the question about why measure um, comes up when we look at the new uh, uh, EU health security uh, legislation on cross-border threats to health. That includes two different um, kinds of um, assessment and, and measurement um, efforts. Article 7 talks about um, triennial reports um, that are intended to ensure the accountability of the member states for their expectations under the international health regulations and also the, the EU. And this requires standardized objective metrics so they can be compared across countries and over time. So the SPAR measures and the additions that the EU will be using, I think, are a good example of that. Article eight in this legislation calls, about, calls on ECDC to do assessments of mem member states. And these are intended, we believe, to inform a dialogue regarding quality improvement. And this requires a more qualitative approach. Um, and th that's the kind of approach I wanna talk about in my presentation um, today. So the second question I wanna bring up is what to measure. And um, when you think about it, um, critical incidents like COVID and other cross-border threats to health are singular events. They're unique in their context and specifics. COVID is it's actually unusual in that the same um, virus hit countries around the world, but even then it hit it at different times when there were different uh, characteristics uh, and, and so on. Second thing to remember is that the public health system is fragmented. Um, it, it, it involves lots of organizations, uh, official public health agencies, healthcare delivery systems, policymakers, civil protection agencies, civil society, media, and so on, that we don't think of as, as sometimes they don't even think of themselves as being in the health um, um, business. Um, and it's also uh, fragmented in that there are global, national, subnational, um, and local um, uh, units uh, in every country, and, and even those structures vary. It's hard to know who's responsible for what. The result is that the effective response is uh, complex and multifactorial, the accountability is not clear, um, and so on. But also one finding from this is that we can't rely on statistical outcome measures to assess how well a system performed. So what we have to do instead is focus on capabilities as well as uh, capacities. And I think this is what Katie was getting at in her last, uh, in her last point. A lot of what we've been um, talking about um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the past has been focused on uh, capacities, the things that are shown in the left of, of this slide here. Um, basically what's on hand um, in public health um, systems that can be called on during, during an emergency. And obviously they're, they're important, but we want to really focus on um, response capabilities that describe how the system uh, can perform um, during, um, during an emergency. 
And here, um, this is a logic model we developed for in conjunction with the ECDC. And we've now revised um, looking at the experience um, with, with COVID. Um, the text in red um, and, and italics are re reflect the re revisions um, in the areas that, that we looked at. Um, this really thinks about how can the system, the public health system um, re respond I think the most the area um, things like uh, testing and uh, epidemic and surveillance and so on, um, Katie Highland highlighted as areas where this the countries are relatively well prepared. Um, health services we talk about population based medicine, re which really has to do with the integration of public health and healthcare, um, and that's also an area that she highlighted as one that needs more um, the development. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to talk about the fact uh, more about qualitative assessment um, methods. Um, there have really been a lot of developments um, in, in, in the health security um, area over the last 10, 20 years in, in how we um, assess um, preparedness in a qualitative way. Uh, this includes um, things like the, uh, the uh, joint external evaluation um, and, uh, and, and the uh, the uh, UHPR that I think Paolo will, will, will talk about and some of the simulation exercises um, that maybe we'll hear about um, in Finland that I know that the European um, uh, Observatory has been working on. There's also ha has been a lot of work on um, after action reviews, um, some following um, um, tools developed by the WHO, some um, more um, developed in individually. Um, and there has been a lot of work on drills and simulation exercises as an assessment um, method um, in a lot of um, countries ar around the world. And I, I would just say, if you go to the next slide, um, that we have developed um, an idea about how to be more rigorous um, and develop more meaningful results using qualitative tools. Sometimes people think, well, if it's qualitative, it's not objective, it's not worthwhile. But in fact, there are approaches that we can take to make it more useful, to employ a structured process, to focus on specific incidents that are selected um, because of what they, we can learn from them, to, to, to pre-identify capacities and capabilities and focus on them at an appropriate level of generalization, uh, conducted at the appropriate time when you have time to reflect, but not um, um, too far um, after the event involve the full range of stakeholders, not just the, um, the, the people who were um, directly involved in the response, involve professional peers, um, use a no, salt, uh, no fault systems framework. The, the, the buy-in leadership, buy leadership is important and employ tools such as simulation exercises, facilitated lookbacks and root cause uh, analysis. So at, at that point, I think I'll stop um, and, and, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Excellent presentation, and it was a great overview of measuring and uh, ways to monitor health system preparedness, including the qualitative approach as well. So, as you mentioned, pandemic preparedness has developed independently of the HSPA approach somewhat, but it's good to see that there are also some commonalities and also opportunities for the HSPA process to incorporate pandemic preparedness and health system resilience in a more structured way and use qualities of approaches as well. And this is what Lina Kaisa as well as Paula have been working on recently. So I hope they can share their experience. And now we are moving on to uh, Lisa, Lina Kaisa. Uh, she's a, a professor, Lina Kaisa Tinkinen. She's a chief researcher at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare and an expert in health systems and policies. Lina Kaisa and her team has undertaken several large projects related to the COVID-19 health system response in Finland. And recently, they worked on health system resilient testing pilot for Finland for the observatory and OECD, where they applied the HSPA framework for universal health coverage to test how next pandemic would affect Finnish health system. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from sunny Finland. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to, to attend these um, webinars with great experts. And uh, in this spotlight, I'm going to uh, shortly go through the, the rough research, uh, results we've uh, had in our research that we've done during the COVID-19 pandemic on governing uh, the pandemic in Finland. And then I will reflect shortly the 
the experiences from the resilience testing pilot Marina was just mentioning. So if I can have my first slide, please. So this is the, the very traditional iceberg, but I think it quite well uh, highlights and, and also um, illustrates how the pandemic preparedness is often taught. And this is also uh, confirmed in our qualitative research we've done to over 50 experts that have had been uh, like involved in the gov uh, pandemic governance in Finland. So uh, many times we, we talk about health system capacity, we, we talk about uh, uh, PPEs, we talk about medicine or, or some other equipment. But actually, uh, and, and this was also when we asked from the, the managers and, and decision makers uh, about the preparedness, these were usually the first things that they, they started to discuss. But when we dig a little bit deeper, we start, um, uh, find we we find a lot more um, that are actually um, more qualitative in in nature and PPE means personal protective uh, equipment. I'm sorry, so so that's the the meaning of the PPE. So so when we start digging deeper and and look under the surface, we actually find a lot more. Um, that and, and a lot of things that actually explain a lot from what Caitlin was also refer, referring to, that, that we can be very well prepared uh, on paper, but when the actual uh, event happens, it may be that these things that are related to trust, um, politics, um, people's action, interactions, uh, ability to collaborate, ability to interact with, with other officials, for instance, when these come to play, it actually may change the also the very well prepared country to to um, to struggle with their response. And I think our research has also highlighted that even though Finland has been a very well prepared country, as also was shown in the Caitlin's uh, uh, presentation, we've also uh, uh, encountered many issues that actually have to do a lot with these kinds of uh, things. If I can have this next next slide, slide please. I think what we also find uh, from our resilience testing pilot, which was um, short of a roundtable discussion uh, in which we brought uh, different stakeholders at different levels of health system and from different backgrounds around the same table to discuss uh, pandemic preparedness and a certain pandemic uh, scenario. Um, and, and, the, and, and the discussion was uh, structured based on the HSPA framework that was actually just shown by Caitlin in her presentation. And I think what the with what our experience of, of this kind of um, exercise tells us is that it's really uh, the politics, values, and ethical considerations that have to do with uh, that, that the, the decision makers uh, and managers actually have to deal with uh, when they are encountering crisis. Those were really um, um, explicit in the discussions. And I think that also showed that that, that these kinds of exercises and also qualitative ways to assess um, preparedness and also uh, highlight certain issues can also add to HSPA uh, frameworks and, 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 and traditional frameworks to assess health system um, performance. What we also find and what was mentioned also by, by uh, Professor Stodo was that it was actually very uh, important for the stakeholders to sit around the same table and actually discuss with, with each other. So that was also something that wasn't uh, well, uh, that wasn't very common uh, when they discussed preparedness. And, and this kind of tool, which can be based on HSPA framework, uh, may also help um, the stakeholders to come together and discuss together. But what is also, I think, evident is that even though health system performance assessment and public health preparedness are often uh, discussed and also developed uh, in a separate steer, um, strands, so to say, um, I think one of the findings from the Finnish uh, system is that when, when the system has solid foundations and when the 
uh, health system performance actually um, is at a good level. It also um, helps to work in a crisis. And this is a citation from one of the uh, interviews from, from the government. Um, and I think that the HSPA is, and, and, and based also on our resilience testing pilot, it can also help uh, to acknowledge the issues that are there under the surface. So, <clears throat> so while many, many times we discuss those uh, usual suspects in terms of, of preparedness, these kinds of systematic tools can also help to spot uh, those things that, that are not always that obvious. And also it can help us experts to also um, convince the decision makers that, uh, that we actually need to invest in, <clears throat> in many things, not only certain um, areas of, of our health systems uh, in order to be, be um, well prepared. So in, in, in um, to conclude with, I think that, uh, for instance, our experiences from our uh, research during COVID-19 and also uh, based on the resilience testing pilot, I think um, uh, those experiences show that, that, that we need systematic ways to discuss these things. And we also need qualitative measures to uh, sort of get under the surface. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lina Kaisa, for the excellent presentation and for sharing pandemic preparedness experience in Finland and also stressing that preparedness in practice on the ground is different from preparedness in the plants and how well-prepared countries like Finland um, can also find the wider HSPA approach useful, particularly when explaining the issues to policymakers. And now, last but not least, we move to Paula Visconcelos. She is a medical doctor and a senior expert in public health responsible for coordination of public health emergencies operations center as the director director general of health in portugal paula has worked on emergency preparedness and response for multiple infectious diseases and global threats including covid of course at the national regional and global levels as a former ecdc and who staff and recently paula has been working on applying the who health system framework to the portuguese pandemic preparedness please paula the floor is yours Thank you. Thank you to my former uh, colleagues and, and good afternoon to everybody on, uh, in any places you may be. Uh, so as you noticed, when they published this uh, webinar, they addressed three questions. And my challenge here is to try to reply to those questions and give a little bit thinking for whoever is attending to this uh, workshop. It's a webinar. So meaning that whatever we try to contribute here with our experience and knowledge should be uh, fit for further thoughts and possibly thinking how you apply this in your own uh, environment and uh, work settings. So uh, I have one single slide. And so the question, first question is, which pandemic preparedness strategy strengthening health system resilience? Very easy. All of the strategies in our days must have the health system resiliency approach. Uh, as you may know, um, with the pandemic, WHO published a strategic preparedness and response guidance for the countries to come up with the plans. And it was the clear uh, 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 kind of assessment and guidance to make uh, the early detection, the surveillance, the data analysis, the risk assessment, the response coordination, the public health measures being non-pharmacological, pharmacological, the risk communication, very clear that countries should make sure that those areas was assessed, was qualified in a way that in for WHO was to guide support they would need. But this attempt is not from the COVID. There is an important document from 2012 from WHO that make clear how to assess the health system capacity within the crisis management approach. And they come up with these six major areas. As you see, they interlink leadership and government, a health workforce, medical products, vaccines and technology, health information, health financing and service delivery. 
there is no way you can talk about um, a health system resiliency without the capacity to assess the health care and the health covered capacities and capabilities in the resource framework. As well, uh, when we go to the second question, can health system strengthening and pandemic preparedness be aligned? The answer is they shouldn't be anymore not aligned. I just said previously, so there, there is more and more a tendency, even with academic publications, to follow ECDC, to follow the latest document from WHO uh, reported last year that summarized all existing frameworks on health system that facilitates this understanding of alignment. You can't never say how good you are prepared for anything that come if you do not align your public health services and your care delivery capacity in, in uh, delivery and coverage. So to facilitate this, of course, the CDC had uh, after a, a contribution for uh, the team from Professor Michael that was here today with us, they clearly make it sense that for these capacities and capabilities of public health emergencies, there you go. You cannot miss early detection. You can't miss the policy developments, the adaptation, the capacity of the governments to implement their strategies, the health system uh, on all their dimension of access, coverage, quality, and safety. And also, of course, the communication and the coordination of, of, of those. So to make it easy, how this came in a more operational way. So WHO come up uh, with a specific proposal from lesson learned from COVID to make sure you interlink uh, who is responsible to make the health system more resilient, governments, politicals. Who's responsible to make your components of uh, preparedness more strength, being that through international health regulation, being that through joint external evaluation, being that through other evaluation tools like uh, Finland uh, proposed and showed their experience. How to make it something that will support decision-making. So UHPR, this universal health and preparedness review, make a map, a support the countries mapping existing assessments done, being those on universal coverage or being those on public health preparedness and response, and use a set of indicators that will give more consistency to the aspects of decision makers to identify the priorities within healthcare delivery, so resilience in the health system, and public health preparedness and response, so strengthening all the components for surveillance, for early detection, being that clinical lab environment, other sources of information, with a strong capacity to do the right management of the information, to extract the right proxy indicators that will guide the decisions, being those pharmacological or non pharmacological. Our experience tells us that. This is still a pilot, meaning that some refined indicators and some refined approach of the tool as an instrument is still to be uh, further uh, make it more consistent to reach the goal pretended. How to serve something that will guide poli politically the right decision to strengthen both big dimension on the way we work in health, delivering care with the universal coverage approach and make sure our public health measures are adequate in the right proportion and the right capacity for people to accept them. And I would close here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula, uh, for giving us this overview on the pandemic preparedness strategies and also on talking about your experience using the WHO Toolkit on Crisis Management for Portugal and on the importance of aligning health system strengthening with pandemic preparedness. So uh, now I invite all of our four great speakers for the discussion and Q&A. Please turn on your cameras. And uh, yes, so we can see you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Erica, what do, what do we have in the chat box? Okay. Um, 
we've had some things come through in the chat. We've also had some things come through to me on email, which is unusual, but you know, all questions are welcome. So um, a couple of points for clarification from uh, Caitlin, um, and that's to do with a bit more detail on how the ratings were achieved, how, how they were actually put in place but also a little bit more data on uh, information on the methods. So how were the countries selected, things like that. So just a couple of points for clarification from you. Um, question probably more for Michael um, on how um, the IHR fit into all of this um, and into these uh, discussions. And a uh, question for Lena Kaiser. So, were there any lessons from the work that you've done on leadership during the pandemic? Uh, were there any lessons learned for that around health system strengthening? So lessons on leadership during the pandemic that can be then usefully used for health system strengthening, sort of like health systems reform work that's uh, done for sort of um, uh, health and health system performance assessment more broadly, maybe. And then one question that's come in, which I suppose is for everybody, um, which is where are the big gaps in research and where are the most urgent gaps in research regarding pandemic preparedness? Now that we've got so much data and so much material that's been collected during the, uh, during the pandemic, where should we be focusing our resources now? So we can hopefully come back for a second round. Thank you. I will begin with answering um, the questions regarding mythology. Um, so the country selected um, were those that actually had national influenza pandemic preparedness plans available on the ECDC website in July um, last year. Um, we National influenza plans were the most commonly found across countries, um, considering the impending threat of influenza, I think is very well known. And most countries had these plans developed. And all of the plans that were publicly available um, at that time were analyzed. Um, and so that's kind of a random selectment of um, plans for, the, for their analysis. And in terms of the scoring, um, as I said, um, it was a sim simplistic scoring system on a three point Likert scale where the presence of a strategy in, was indicated got a three. Um, if a strategy was partially mentioned um, and there was mentioned kind of for the need of it and um, it wasn't really that well detailed in the sense of they, it was more an, like an idea versus like a real um, established strategy of how they were gonna respond and support that health system um, performance in that area. Um, it received a two and then a one was kind of no mention at all of the, of the strategy of keywords of anything at whatsoever um, in the plan. Um, given um, scores are then given to each of the performance assessment areas um, in the HSBA framework and average scores um, of the performance assessment areas um, linked to each subfunction were calculated to inform the subfunction scores, and likewise, some function scores were um, averaged to determine the core um, health system function scores that we saw in that um, heat map that I presented. Um, and then, um, so that that's a little bit more detail into how those how we got those ratings. And um, yeah. So I'll, I'll respond to the question about the IHR and, and also the, the gaps, if, if, if I could. I think the IHR and the International Health Regulations 2005 really is the basis of everything um, that we do. But it's interesting to see the evolution. Um, soon after they came out, uh, WHO put out the, uh, the SPAR tool, which essentially required countries to report on, on their capacities. Um, and, and the EU has implemented that um, and, and revised it in, in its new legislation. But what we have seen um, since then really has been the development of the kind of qualitative me measures and, and approaches that I've been talking about. Um, the JEE, uh, Joint Ex External Evaluation to WHO, UNHPR uh, uh, that, that Paolo was, was, was speaking about um, coming along, um, tools for um, doing after action reviews and simulation exercises and other things like that. So I think that we have to sort of move from the, uh, the, the basic assessment of the capability of the capacities um, that, are, that are in SPAR and so on to the capabilities that, that these other qualitative methods uh, can uh, help us get at. If I could address the question about gaps in research, there's lots I could say. Um, but I think that one of the things that I would ask for um, is about learning more about what worked 
not just the interventions, but the systems needed to support it. So it's not just uh, we need better data, but what kind of how do we actually set up a surveillance system to operate in real time to give us the information that, that we need? Um, it's not just um, vaccines, but how do we overcome hesitancy to vaccines? So I'm thinking from the point of view of the public health practitioners on the ground who are doing this work, what can we actually do better to help to achieve these uh, the, these goals? I think there's a lot of uh, experience out there that, that can be mined to learn a lot from. Thank you very much. Paula, you wanted to add something. Uh, yes, uh, on research, um, it's interesting because it's one of the areas included to assess uh, within emergency preparedness and response. It's how capable our country to allocate specific groups to build up uh, evidence through the process, especially if it's a known situation or even if it's an, a known situation, which are the new settings that facilitates the operational research. And this is one of the key questions that are started to be included. ECDC is keen on uh, making clear it's one of the competencies that assessors, uh, uh, whoever wants to, to participate in, in uh, external assessments should also have, and, and also member states are more and more creating the need to have such a, a, a specific area where um, not only the, the so-called uh, scientific evidence is, is necessary, but also the evidence that comes with experience, the, the kind of proof of things we do best in the best practice, the balance between the few information and the decision that was most adequate uh, for the benefits of, of, of the population, of course. As just to make it clear, it's more and more uh, one of the components to be assessed and to be promoted at the member states. If I, I need to apologize, if I need to cut uh, my, my participation, I just want to thank everybody from the invitation, from colleagues, speakers, and the audience, and anything through email, we can also further respond if it's necessary. Thank you so much, and till next time. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. Lina, Lina Kaiser, do you want to jump jump in? Sure, uh, uh, but can you repeat the question? Because I'm not sure if, if I followed. <laughs> Was it about uh, how the lessons learned from our research could help? Yeah, could help in, other aspects yeah. of health and okay. strengthening. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that there were many things that actually came out that sort of um, that the pandemic made visible the actual gaps we have in the system uh, and, and which have which have been um, pushed forward in the system for a long time, but they haven't really succeeded. One, of course, is about data. Uh, in Finland, we have a lot of data in, in, in relative terms. We, we, we have great registers and, and things like that. For, for, for instance, data on health workforce how the health workforce is actually located in the system and, and, and things like that. We don't have too much data. And, and, and there were also other things, um, data from social services, for instance, um, is something that we would definitely need also to, to strengthen uh, also health systems and to sort of prioritize the actions there. Uh, I think it also uh, highlighted the importance of collaboration in the complex systems like health systems, um, which in, in Finland, uh, probably in relative terms, it, it might be very successful, but also we, um, in, in our research, we discovers, uh, discovered uh, many things that were to do with trust. And actually, there, I, I think in the chat box, there was one uh, question also related to the issue of trust. So whether the, the different stakeholders at different levels actually trust each other, and also uh, whether the trust can also, or, or the lack of trust can also lead to, to um, uh, issues where, for instance, um, knowledge or data or information that would actually be needed at local level, for instance, was not provided for the local authorities because the national authorities didn't trust to, to them. So maybe these kinds of things and also these 
uh, interconnections between different actors in the system was probably made more visible and also um, this strengthening of multi-sectoral collaboration is probably something that we will certainly work on in Finland more. And I think finally it also made um, quite clear that the, the sort of the political determinants of health and, and health systems um, in a way that 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 when certain issues are um, high on the political agenda, some other issues are left behind and how we can deal with these things also in the context of vulnerable groups, for instance, uh, people that are not that visible or have that uh, loud voices in the society. So I think these kinds of issues, uh, at least, um, um, I could highlight at this point. Thank you very much. Michael, I'm going to ask you a really hard question. I hope you don't mind. Go how ahead. Would you, how would you measure trust in leadership? Where would <laughs> we even start with that? <laughs> well, um, that's. I think that's really hard. Um, and let me, let me just say that, you know, one thing that I um, have been thinking based on this present all the presentations today is that there's the relationship between um, preparedness and uh, resilience. And um, I think that preparedness um, comes down to do, do you have the systems that, that are in place, the, the capacities, the capabilities, uh, and so on. But whether or not they perform um, is resilience. And, and some of the key ingredients you know, in getting from preparedness to, to, to resilience um, are do you have trust? Um, do you have a, a consideration about uh, ethics and do you take values into account in an in in, in, in 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 important way? So uh, you may have seen the, the famous picture of Donald Trump holding up the picture, the page from the Global Health Security Index saying the U.S. was number one. Well, yeah, that's preparedness, um, but we didn't get resilience because of that, that, that gap there. So, you know, maybe the way that we that we measure trust um, is looking at that gap between performance um, in re resilience and uh, and preparedness. Of course, you can also measure it in lots of different ways, including um, uh, surveys of, of of individuals and so on. But I think the point that Lena Kaiser made too about you know the, it's also trust between different levels of the system, um, and that then whether we have that social capital um, is really important. Lena Kaiser. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, that I, I think that's just a fantastic way to, to put it, that we have preparedness and the, the actual response determines whether the system is resilient. And I also, also what, what I would like to add is that the, the response has to be resilient in a way that it doesn't cause too much harm after the actual shock, because what we see in Finland, for instance, and globally, I, I think, is, is for instance, it has to do with health workforce, that the, the, the response wasn't made in a way that it would have taken into account actually the health workforce and, and their um, well-being and, and, and ethical considerations or whatever. And now, at least in Finland, we see not entirely because of the pandemic, but also related to that, that we see a huge um, like resource uh, scarcity because people are leaving uh, the workforce or, or the, they are changing the, the sector. So I think resilience would also be making a response in a way that it also maintains trust after the, the actual event. Um, do I have time for one more question, Marina? Are you going, or are you going to be strict? I think you have time, yes. Okay, so one quick question, just in the spirit of you know, following the money. Um, going back to Caitlin's presentation, um, financing always seems to be the neglected component in, you know, uh, national pandemic preparedness planning. Um, why do we think this is? What, you know, where, where, where is, where, where, where do they always neglect where the money is going to come from? So. Yeah, I think, I think this touches a lot on um, topics that were discussed in the first webinar of the series, but it's somewhat representative, like the general unwillingness to, uh, to invest in preventative measures where there is no like immediate return in that investment. Um, when the, the share of funding going towards public health and prevention is always smaller and um, then the money that goes towards curative and long-term care, even though the return on that is in truly much larger. And rather than being seen as an expenditure, investments in prevention should be considered more like an investment 
in that enables citizens um, to continue living more fulfilling and productive lives and takes into account the long-term benefits of education attainment and labor productivity and the overall physical and, well and mental well-being of society. So I think the re I think to get a few more financing um, investments and pre preparing health system financing functions to perform, there needs to kind of overcome um, that unwillingness to kind of invest in preventative measures. Michael, do you have a an idea or no I think I think that that, that Caitlin is uh, is right. I mean prevention um, you know uh, it's hard to invest in, in, in something that's not uh, uh, tangible. I also th think we have to do think we have to pay attention though to the fact that um, we sometimes ask for more money than 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 can be justified um, by talking about all the things that can possibly happen um, and not rec re representing not recognizing that there are opportunity costs. So I think that we that within the uh, the preparedness community we have to really think through you know what are the things that really do matter the most where can we get our the biggest bang for the for the for the buck um, rather than saying these are all things that are essential um, and. Uh, and, and, and therefore getting none. So Lena Kaiser, 30 seconds before we hand back to Marina to sum up. <laughs> I can pass it back to Marina. I think Caitlin and, and, and Michael put it very well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. And just a quick wrap up. So uh, we heard today that HSPA can also be used to guide pandemic preparedness and as structure incorporate various health system elements that would have otherwise been omitted. But also, as we heard from Caitlin, the linkages are not always straightforward and there's also a need for more research and evidence and reflecting on the variety of threats and also different contexts that we heard from Paula. Now also um, uh, about the uh, how health systems perform and whether they are resilient, these are two different things. So they may not perform unless you have those trust and values. So the discussion that we just had and addressing the gaps across the entire system is crucial and making sure that the response is also mitigated when coming out of the crisis situation so that health system functioning is sustainable. So this is what um, I've heard from Lena Kais and Professor Stoto. And we also heard about measurement of preparedness in various tools and what they can do, especially in terms of assigning responsibility for actions to specific actors and how we can supplement the tools using the qualitative approaches. Uh, and then from the example of Finland, which I thought was very interesting as well, is how HSPA can help to convince decision makers on the need for preparedness actions and also bringing the range of policymakers together and so the Finnish pilot has shown that HSPA can create the solid foundation for pandemic preparedness, but on its own, it's obviously not enough. And finally, um, you can't know if you are prepared unless you align your efforts with the health system strengthening and the pandemic preparedness action. So that's what it's all about. Thank you so much. And thank you to our excellent speakers and also huge thanks to Erica, as well as Lucy and Annalisa and everyone else who is organizing the seminar series. Thank you very much. Bye, have a good day. Thank you to the audience for the excellent questions as well. Mm -hmm.